And as a traditionally published writer, I was doing fine. I mean, I liked my editor. I liked uh, the cover designers that were over there, um, had no problems with Penguin or Midnight Inc. Um, but at the same time, I, I wasn't making a ton of money at it either. Uh, I think at one point I was like, I think the guy driving my books in a truck to the various stores are probably making more than I am. Hello and welcome to the Writer's Mindset Podcast with me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Betts. Each week, we're here to bring you the strategies and advice you need to achieve your writing goals. That's right. This week, we're talking to Elizabeth Span Craig about being a hybrid author with several long running cozy mystery series. Our interviewee this week is Elizabeth Span Craig. She's a library-loving, cozy mystery author and an avid mystery reader. A pet-only southerner, her four series are full of cats, corgis and cheese grits. Now, what is a cheese grit? All I know is that there's some sort of American food that we can't get in the UK. American friends, tell us more. We need to know. I mean, it's got cheese in. It's going to be good, right? (laughs) Well, we've obviously got to find dairy-free versions because neither of us can eat cheese, but still. That's beside the point. Uh, Where was I? Oh, yes. Elizabeth is a mother of two and lives with her husband, a fun-loving corgi and a shy fluffball of a cat. I sat down with Elizabeth to talk about her journey from being a Penguin-published Midlist author to a best-selling indie author. She also runs a great blog for writers and has been a long-term supporter of the Writer's Cookbook, which we love. Yep, I can't remember the first time she shared one of our posts, but I can tell you it's always made a massive difference. Some of our most popular posts and podcast episodes are so popular because she shared them with her Twitter followers. Wow, she's an MVP of the Writer's Cookbook Massive then, yeah? (laughs) I have no idea what that means. (laughs) (laughs) I was suggesting that Writer's Cookbook fans have created a gang and that Elizabeth is one of the most prevalent members. Yeah, I'll take that. (laughs) But it shows the difference that the right person sharing your content can make, doesn't it? It does. And for the record, I'm drinking Coke and water from a wine glass, both now and in the recording. Mm. Not wine at three in the afternoon. I mean, I wouldn't blame you for relaxing with a nice glass of wine. It is absolutely boiling out there and anything you need to get through is perfectly justified. But also, alcohol is dehydrating, so it ends up making you feel worse in the hot weather rather than better. But placebo effect, it makes you feel better. If that's what you want. (laughs) I'm sober, also for the record. (laughs) We're just delirious from the heat. I think that's it. I think that's it. (laughs) If you find this and our other episodes valuable, you can support the Writer's Mindset over on Patreon. You'll get early access to episodes, bonus content, and our undying gratitude for supporting all the work that goes into creating these episodes for you. And you can become a podcast patron for as little as £1, which is about $1.50 per month. To find out more, visit patreon.com forward slash writer's mindset. So, personal updates. This week I have a bit of a confession and Ellie can't say anything to reply because she's got to mute herself before Frankie goes for a crap. So, <laughs> I have time okay, to finish what tell, I'm saying but without her interrupting me. No, I'm going to interrupt you. Bad, Chrissy. Bad, you Christina. You don't know what I did yet. Yeah, I'm already saying it's bad. I nearly mentioned it last week and then I kind of forgot but a few times in the last couple of weeks I have considered quitting. I've genuinely considered stopping writing, stopping publishing, just being fucking done with it all because I was so stressed and so emotionally drained and, you know, book sales aren't as good as they used to be. And it just made me think, why am I putting myself through this? Because there's been so much stress, not just about book covers, book book covers, book sales, but about everything else um, as well. I've got a few things going on at the moment. Go on. I just, I know, I know that feeling and I know it's hard to, to come to terms with that, that reality that it is hard. It is hard, isn't it? Keep going, to keep going and to keep pushing through when you feel like you're buried under and you can't see the light, right? Yeah, exactly. I think buried is a good way of describing it. I, um, when I finished Necromancer Secret, I tried to continue the daily writing habit doing Hollywood Heartbreak, but because they're both really exhausting books, 
I couldn't do it. And also because a lot of the gaps in Hollywood Heartbreak now aren't so much writing, they're the overlaps with what happens in New York. So it's a case of copying the dialogue across and then adding in the description that parallels what's there, but from a different point of view, which is a bit of a mindfuck sometimes. It's tedious as well, I imagine. It doesn't feel like writing. It feels like sewing words together. <laughs> it's actually been reassuring. Really? Because I don't like going through back back through old writing i hate it and i read back through old bits and i'm like i quite like this bit oh that description's really good oh i remember that outfit i should wear that outfit <laughs> do you put and... your characters in your own outfits i love that not always but a couple of them yeah but also it's things i would wear like mm. in what happens in new york there's a lot of like plaid skirts with really thick tights and then a wig woolly jumper because that's what i like to wear in the winter so not when it's super cold but when it's a little bit cold that's what i like to wear so both tate and holly wear some version of that as i said i'm getting new covers done for what happens in series and i start with what happens in new york because i love the covers but i am aware that they are a little bit outdated now and there's a lot more competition in my genre than there were three years ago just to confirm though to go back to your first point you're not giving up on writing are you no, no, I'm not. It's one of those things, like, I took a break of a couple of days where I didn't do anything fiction-related. I, like, tinkered with some ads and stuff, and that was it. Um, mm -hmm. Just to give myself that headspace, because it wasn't a case of, like, oh, I'm not in the mood, I can't be bothered. This was a case of, if I do it, I'm going to resent it, and it's going to piss me off, and I'm mm -hmm. going to end up hating it further down the line. Yeah. So I needed that break and that emotional distance for a little bit from writing fiction that's fair and it's good to listen to your well i was going to say your body but it's more your mind in this case isn't it listening to yourself and going actually I, I can't write this right now i do need a break and giving yourself a break at those times is important too how's your writing been going this week anyway so i have a new uh schedule system for my writing um which i started this week and i know it's only a week in so i don't want to talk too highly of it in case it all goes it's up. I, I'm very, very good at procrastinating. And in my mind, I go, oh, I don't need to do that yet. I don't need to do that yet. Uh, I'll come back to it. I've got plenty of time. I'll do it later. You know, <laughs> I've still got X amount of days before. That absolutely needs to be done. Um, so I'm very good at procrastinating in that sense. And I will justify it to myself in my head a million different ways. So what I've done, and it's a very rough kind of plan but in excel i've just put out the rest of the days in the month the percentage i need to be 100 percent on these two particular po projects by the end of the month look at my shiny hand <laughs> i need Are to be a... listening not watching gally is now admiring her hand which is weirdly <laughs> glowing in the light from her window <laughs> i'm so pasty that i now glow in the sun <laughs> ah. i feel better about how pale i am now because i don't glow um I need to be 100% for these two projects by the end of the month. And so I've worked out what percentage I need to be by the end of weeks two, three, and well, two, three, and then four is the end of the month because I started this a week in. And then I broke that down to the days I want to work on that project in the week and therefore what percentage I want to get to to those, project on the, those projects on those days, which sounds very tedious and very logical and boring. Um, but in fact, it gave me a kind of self accountability. Like I find accountability is a massive motivator, um, for getting stuff done, <clears throat> not just, um, deadlines for uni work that I managed to justify it, you know, um, having accountability in terms of working with friends and, um, writing buddies. And I have a friend who lives nearby and we do study sessions now. And it's that dedicated time going, okay, this person's here. We're here to work. I'll do it now. And if they weren't there, perhaps they wouldn't. But having those percentages laid out and seeing that by this day, I need to hit, say, 75% because um, that project was already on like 74 or whatever. <laughs> I'm not trying to do 75% of a project in one week. Don't worry. But I had to do like 10 or 15% in the week. And so by Wednesday, it needed to be so far ahead. And then by Friday, it needed to be so far ahead. And yes, I didn't want to write on those days and I didn't want to do those words. And if I didn't have that schedule set out, I would have gone, oh, no, I'll just do this tomorrow. But I could see, and it seems so silly, but I could see physically on the calendar, okay, if I don't hit 70% this day, well, I've got to hit 75% in two days. So that's twice as much work. Um, and then I won't be on track to do it by the end of the month with reasonable time to do these things, etc. And so it, I, 
I keep saying self-accountability, but I've never really had that before. There's probably a better word for it, but I've never had that self-motivation in a way, or it is accountability. That feeling of physically seeing where I needed to be pushed me to actually do it. And like the first day I was like, oh, I've only got to write 6% of this today, which was about 800 words. And it dragged for the first couple of hundred. And I was like, right, I'm just going to swap scenes. Like I've got a load of scenes planned out. And I swapped to a particular scene and it just sort of flowed because I was sitting there going, you need to write right now. And I picked a scene I was more open to in the moment. And yeah, the scene came out really well. And the characters, I think, really came out well. I think I sent you a quote from one of the characters. I can't remember what it was about, but something explicit um, you did and the voice was really strong in it it was one of your side characters i know that and it was, was a side something character. sarcastic she was saying something very sarcastic and uh the side characters are um doing well i think there was something sasha said in the sasha interview about side characters representing your theme or, or at least contributing to the theme and helping it in some way and i realized that these two side characters i had are a great way of doing that I just hadn't fully brought it out yet like they were kind of there and they were ready to do that for me I just hadn't like had that little thing click in place I like it I like money schedule I'll keep you updated how it goes because as I said I'm very good at procrastinating uh, <laughs> but, but also now thing... you've got the accountability of hundreds of listeners Oh no! As well as yourself. Oh my god! And me. People and our friends. If you want to, and Millie and Frankie. If anyone wants to um, aggressively keep me in check, feel free to tweet me. It's at Ebet's Writer. I will feel the peer pressure and do it. So feel free to let me know. <laughs> Maybe we need to do regular accountability threads in the Facebook group. Maybe. Because I know a lot of writing groups do do that, and people find it helpful. Like on the Monday, they post what they're going to do that week, and then on the friday not the friday the sunday um they post what they've achieved that week basically that's a good show i'm gonna start that i'm gonna start that in the facebook group because and i'll share my shitty spreadsheet with people if they really want it but i promise you it's not that impressive <laughs> but uh, yeah we can do that I, I like that idea and i like uh i like pretending to be proactive when realistically i'm procrastinating most of the time Shall we go catch up with Elizabeth? I think we should. Elizabeth has lots of exciting things to share with our writers. Today, I am joined by Elizabeth Span Craig. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me today. So for anyone who hasn't heard of you, can you just tell listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, what you write, etc.? Absolutely. I am a cozy mystery writer, so I'm writing traditional style mysteries, uh, I think Agatha Christie was probably the one who founded the whole cozy mystery movement. And I've been doing that for about, I'm going to say like 17 years. Uh, I've been published, I guess it's been about 10 or 11 years now. I've got four series. Three of them are active series. Uh, I live in North Carolina with my husband and I've got two kids. They are gone. They're, I'm an empty nester now, but I still, I'm still a mom. They're just not around anymore. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Nice. So you started off published traditionally. Can you talk about your reason behind going from traditional publishing to indie? Like what sure. drew you to indie publishing from the traditional model? I think it was, it was, for me, it was sort of an opportunity um, that presented itself. But at the time, which was around, I guess, 2010, 2011, it was just taking off like crazy. I mean, people were making scads of money out there going uh, indie. And as a traditionally published writer, I was doing fine. I mean, I liked my editor. I liked uh, the cover designers that were over there, um, had no problems with Penguin or Midnight Inc. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't making a ton of money at it either. Uh, I think at one point I was like, I think the guy driving my books in a truck to the various stores are probably making more than I am uh, for my books, which was fine. But I was like, okay, I'd like to have a little bit more control. For one thing over production, which is very slow, as everyone knows with traditional publishing, it's usually one book a year. I was writing more than one series, but it still was just adding up to just pretty much a book a year. And uh, I had two things happen. I had um, editors to go, which is also something that happens with traditional publishing quite a bit, where you become orphaned is what they call it, which sounds very dramatic. But basically your <laughs> editor 
goes off to do something else for a while. And then you don't have that editor anymore to kind of pitch for you at production meetings or whatever. And so I had one editor that went off to take care of her mom in another state. Totally understand that. That series just pretty much had one more book in it. And then it was dead in the water after that. And then I um, also got orphaned over at Midnight Inc. Um, and the editor who came in just totally did not get what I was, I was trying to do. I mean, she hadn't been the one who accepted my work. Um, it had been the other editor and she just, I don't think she was much of a cozy mystery fan. She was like, why do we have an octogenarian sleuth? <laughs> she was trying to maybe make like, major changes. I'm like, I have kind of already committed to this. So she was like, no more books. And that gave me a perfect opportunity to just take that series indie. I asked for my rights back. I got my rights back. And from then on, I think I'm at book 18 or 19 or something in that series. So that's worked out really well for me. So it was, there was a lot of opportunity there. Also the Penguin Random House merger happened and then things got shaken up there and they let my editor go for that series during the merger. So it really had a lot to do with the, the problems that are inherent with traditional publishing. It's a long-winded answer to your question there. <laughs> No, I totally understand. Like a lot of the reasons you listed are the reasons I went independent and some of our listeners chose to go independent as well. Like the bureaucracy, the politics, the control, you know, it does have an effect on you as a writer. No question. Um, because you don't have that control. You don't have any control at all. And so then you go to independent publishing where you have all of the control. I, that's a little intimidating, of course, at first, yeah. but I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things, you either love the control or you're terrified. No, actually, you can love the control and be terrified of it, I think. Either you love it or you hate it, and then terror is probably just universal, I think, of that amount of control and power over your own career sometimes, I think. Well I put. That's me. <laughs> definitely so, definitely so. I, I think I do have a bit of a control freak in me, and it was greatly satisfied by going to independent publishing. <laughs> How many books did you publish traditionally before you moved? Um, I think it was maybe 12 books, something like that. And now I'm at over 40 books. Um, so I have done more, obviously, on the independent side now. Um, just because also, like I mentioned, the ability to write five or six books a year. I mean, during the pandemic, I think I did six. I mean, what else was there to do <laughs> in 2020 besides read and write? You couldn't go anywhere or do anything. Uh, so I just wrote books and read books, and that's pretty much my entire... In fact, I looked at my journal just the other day. I was like, what did I do during 2020? And all of my journal entries were what was going on in the news. So I was like, <laughs> clearly, I was watching the news, reading and writing, and that was it. <laughs> yep. Did you find that the pandemic influenced any of the books that you wrote? I think um, they were a little darker, or I've been told, <laughs> <laughs> I've been told they were a little darker. <laughs> I usually write pretty lighthearted stuff. So um, for me to in introduce any grim elements is kind of unusual. <laughs> no, I get that. I was like, my stuff's no darker. And then I was like, oh, yeah, the way I kill off that character is pretty evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be fun to write. I totally get it. Yes. <laughs> we all have that streak in us, don't we? <laughs> Definitely so. It's got to come out one way or another. Exactly. And writing is a healthy way for it to come out. That's right. It's better than other ways, which were also <laughs> considered during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the indie versus the traditional thing. What would you say to someone who is conflicted between the two types of publishing? I think, I mean, if you're conflicted, you probably should give traditional publishing a go. I would just give myself a deadline and say, because it can take forever. I mean, if you are not going to write because you're wanting to see this book through to publication, that's, that's going to be taking a lot of time off from writing. I know it took me, I'm going to say, was it five years? I think it was five years or more to sell my first book. It took a Ouch. really long time. It was mostly just getting um, an agent. I had uh, two offers on the book when I went direct to publishers before I got an agent. I had to find an agent by saying, I have a contract and I want somebody to review it. And then finally I got an agent. One of the uh, contracts I negotiated on my own, which did not turn out well. I would not recommend mm. that whatsoever. <laughs> Just for anyone listening in the UK, if you do find that you need someone to review a contract on your, on your own, check out the Society of Authors because they do offer contract reviews for their members, but I think they're UK based. I don't think they do the US and other countries, but I might be wrong. I have done yeah, also um, the, uh, is it the same one, Ally, the um, Alliance yeah. of Independent Authors? Yeah. Yes, they do it as well, actually. I forgot yes. about that because they don't um, use them for that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. They are amazing. Yeah. 
they did that. They did a, I've got a Dutch publisher now and those books are going to come out this fall. And I had no, I mean, I think the, the contract had gone through Google Translate, which I totally understand. <laughs> um, but I was like, I don't understand this contract at all. And they were yeah. good to um, advise on that. So that was good. Yeah. Lots of agencies out there. If you don't want to be tied down, I am still tied down, you know, a, an agent is like having a marriage. I mean, you're still connected to them. (laughs) Even after you say, okay, no more traditionally published books. I mean, we're still, I'm still doing royalties and and dealing with that from Penguin Random House. I know some um, indies do have agents. I think Joanna Penn's got one to juggle some of the different rights and things for her books. So I know it's certainly an option, even if you're not going through a publisher. That's true. Or you could get um, an IP lawyer, intellectual property lawyer, and that's just a one-off thing. So you could just say, oh, because you're not going to get a contract all the time. I mean, you might get a contract that's like for five books or something like that. And then you just need them to review one time for those five books. And they don't, you know, take any of your royalties. Yeah. They are just there to advise the one time and you just pay the yeah. one time fee. And that's also good. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've got to kind of do some research and some digging to find out what is best for you and your book Definitely. and your process. Sure. If you see me looking down, by the way, it's because the dog's lying on my foot. And every time I move my foot, she moves her head. Oh, poor little thing. <laughs> like, She's like, this is not a very good pillow. She said, yeah. this pillow sucks. <laughs> like, dog, you've literally got a bed there. Why can't you lie in the bed and not at my feet? She wants to be close. <laughs> she does. Yeah. She's in that kind of mood. It's really cute. She, she didn't want me an hour ago when we went recording. She was downstairs on the sofa. Oh, of course not. She's like a cat, I can see. Our, our cat's like that too. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's definitely part cat. She's 100% part cat. She behaves exactly like Ellie's cat. And it's like, oh. you a Westie or are you a cat? Or just she's really spoiled? Yeah. Yeah, you are. yeah, okay. So what were the biggest changes when you went from traditional publishing to self tra- self-publishing? I can speak. Um... Yeah. What were the biggest changes? Oh, definitely getting a team together to do things because I am not somebody who can design my own covers. I'm not somebody who can do my own editing and I wouldn't know how to format um, anything. Now I've got draft to digital to run it through. There are all these wonderful programs. But at the time around 2011, when I kind of branched off, there wasn't that for um, for formatting at any rate. So I had a formatter, I had an editor and I had a cover designer And it took a while to get that team together. And that was something I didn't really have to think about with obviously traditional publishing. Um, And I had to put a little bit more um, into marketing, uh, definitely now than I did back then. It was like, if you had a cheap book up on Amazon Kindle, it was gonna fly. I mean, just no matter what, because there wasn't, I mean, you've got a book up for 2.99 or 3.99 or something like that. Um, I mean, I think one of the books has got probably like 2,000, 3,000 reviews. It was getting a lot of people read just because, I mean, it was being, you know, juxtaposed against traditionally published books that were still at 1099 or something for Kindles, um, something ridiculous like that. Of course, mm-hmm. somebody's going to want a book for 299. Why wouldn't they? Um, so there was a little bit less at the time for marketing. But then a couple of years later, when everybody started going into self-publishing a lot more into um, just making sure my website was had, you know, good SEO and, you um, making sure my keywords were on target and doing the occasional ad somewhere. I, I don't like doing that, but it, you know, I try to do it now. I'm trying to be better about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, and that's been a lot of, of changes, but mostly I think the most stressful thing was just getting my team together. Did you find when you were putting it together, you had to kiss some frogs before finding the right ones? I did. It took a little while for me to settle in and, and figure out what I was doing and just too hot, too cold, just right Goldilocks kind of stuff. Um, but it, you know, it worked out and there's a lot of people sharing who their, you know, illustrators are, their cover designers, um, all these people that, that pull things together and they should be acknowledged. And you can usually read those in acknowledgements and um, frequently on people's websites where they talk about who they're using. Um, so in word of mouth, that helps a lot, but it does take a little while to get that team together. Yeah, I definitely found the same thing. And then it turns out that one of my friends was just the most perfect editor for my books because she gets really emotionally involved, but is still still detached enough to be able to give me that feedback. And when she read the first draft of my fantasy novel, she gave me some really harsh feedback and I kind of hated her for it for a bit. And then I was like, damn it, she's right. (laughs) (laughs) And I spent ages fixing all these things. But now that I'm working on books kind of two to five, I'm like, I'm really glad she pushed me then. Because it's made my life a lot easier now. 
Exactly, exactly. And then you've got somebody great who supports you and wants the books. I mean, that doesn't just support you, but wants the books to be the best that they can be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like. I like, you know, give me the harsh criticism now before the book comes out. And so I've got betas that do that extremely well. <laughs> They'll be like, <laughs> Mobile would never do that. What are you doing I love here? that. You I know? love that when your, your readers are like, no, that's so out of character. I love it. Yeah. Um, so when you were published traditionally, what was the marketing process like and how does it compare to indie publishing now? Uh, it was very different. Um, very, very different. And it was because it was so dependent on bookstores. And so basically their idea of advertising was to put your book in the catalog. You know, these are our offerings for spring of whatever year. And, um, and then they would have representatives to obviously visit bookstores and do that sort of thing. But it was very bookstore driven. And at the time, that was great. You know, I knew that I would, when I had a release, I would have a little cardboard stand near the cafe and Barnes and Noble with their new releases. And that was not because of me or anything that I had done. I was sort of like serial placement at the grocery store. It was a deal that they had made with Barnes and Noble, the bookseller. Um, but that has become less and less important as obviously online buying um, of books has become increasingly important to readers. Um, I think we definitely saw that during the pandemic as well. Couldn't go into a bookstore. Um, so it's that part of it is, is not a reason that I would go to traditional publishing, um, their marketing. They also were fond of having me go on, on a book tour or two. Um, not something that was paid for, <laughs> uh, but I would go with a group of other cozy mystery writers and we would split expenses. And um, I'm such an introvert. It's really tough for to drag me out of my house and have me trot around and do and do talks um, in front of readers. I'm much, I have an easy time talking to writers. Uh, it's a little harder for me to speak to my readers in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that yeah, part was, was tough and different. Um, so that's not something that I have really done or pursued. Every once in a while, I'll do an appearance um, as a writer um, to readers instead of writer facing. I, I will do writing conferences. Um, but it's just, it's just a very different approach. Um, now, of course, they're switched into social media. But it's all stuff we can do. Um, you know, we can talk about our releases online and, and we can put up cute pictures on Instagram and we can do all of those things. So there's really not a, a benefit going to traditional publishing from a marketing aspect. And that's, that's my opinion on that anyway. Others will have different you know, opinions and uh, probably different experiences than me. That's definitely in line with stuff I've heard from other traditionally published authors. Although the fact that you had to pay to go on a book tour just blows yeah. my mind. <laughs> like, I know you can expense it and stuff, but you would just expect them to pay for it and expense it. Oh, and they do with, I mean, you know, this is, I was Midwest, so oh, okay. very yeah. different, you know, if it had been John Grisham or somebody like that, you know, mm -hmm. James Patterson, not a problem. Um, although I think they can probably afford better to, yeah. <laughs> to do their own book tours, even if they did it themselves. <laughs> yeah, I, I always remember a particular story that I was told when I went to a writing conference a few years ago about marketing and traditional publishing. And this author said that he'd been invited to an event and he didn't know he'd been invited to an event because the publisher had never passed on the message. So, oh and it was actually a really good opportunity for him, but they were gatekeeping all these opportunities for marketing and networking and he never heard of them. Uh, that, the control freak in me, just, that just drives me crazy too. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Or if somebody would contact my agent about something. Um, and, and in some ways it was, you know, it was a good thing. Like that's how I got one of my series. I got the Southern Quilting series because um, an editor contacted my agent. I'm sure there had been probably some smoozing going on somewhere, um, which I didn't have any part of. Um, but that's how I, I kind of got that gig was, was that way. But at the same time, I would much rather be presented with my own opportunities, <laughs> you know, yeah. and know about things, I don't know, directly. Yeah, yeah it, it's your career at the end of the day. Yes, they are facilitating it, but you're the one who created this thing and you're the one whose future it affects probably the most. So why shouldn't you be provided with opportunity in the first place? Right. Make and especially decision. if they're swamped, you know, then I can understand that. But, you know, I'm not so swamped over here. So <laughs> I'd rather know about the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. So other than what we just talked about, what would you say the pros and cons are of traditional publishing? 
Um, the pros of traditional publishing, I would say probably the biggest one is um, to feel very confident. If you feel like you're not going to be confident, if you need some validation from an outside source, uh, maybe you need validation from your family or friends. Oh, you're traditionally published. If that's very important, that's that's something to consider. Um, although I feel like self-publishing has come such a long way and people understand it better because um, there has been an indie movement as well with film and with music. And it's, you know, it's more acceptable now and it seems more entrepreneurial than anything yeah, right, else. Right. Much I've better. seen it change in like the last five years since I've been publishing, but also the attitudes have changed in the last, when did I do my degree? 13 or so years. I remember when I was finishing my BA in creative writing, everyone turned their nose up at blogging and thought it was like a cheap form of writing and like there'd never be a future in it and only lazy people blogged and stuff. And now look, everyone has a blog. Everyone wants to blog. Everyone thinks they can be a blogger without doing any work to figure out actually how to do it properly. And you know, I think there was that misconception a while back that that's what self-publishing was as well, because you did occasionally get the half ass books published that didn't look great. Right. And now, those of us who do want it to be a career, we put the work in to create an end product that looks traditionally published most of the time. Definitely, definitely. And, and it has changed a lot. Um, that That's just something that's that's been a tremendous change. And I think people are ex more accepting of it now. Um, than they used to be. But that, I would say, yeah, that's that's one reason to go to traditional publishing, if that is very important to you, for whatever reason, for whatever validation you need to get out of it for family, friends, or yourself. Um, I don't think that that should be necessary, though, because you can create a fantastic project on your own, and then you feel even better about it. You know, I was the one who commissioned the cover. I was the one who did all the, you know, commissioned the formatting or blah, blah, blah. And um, so I feel like you can still have that same sense of pride, but, you know, that still is, I would say, a pro to traditional publishing um, as well. If uh, I guess the startup costs um, in terms of you're obviously paying on the front end for your editing, for your cover, for whatever work you need to have done um, in self-publishing, if that's going to be uh, a bit of a problem, especially starting out. And that's something I really didn't have to address as much because I kind of brought my readers with me. Um, so probably I'm not the best person to speak on that, but I totally would understand if, you know, suddenly you're faced with however many hundreds of dollars to, um, to start out with self-publishing, that might be hard to justify not knowing what kind of readership you were going to get at first. That would probably be another reason to go there. Um, but the cons are, you know, I mean, I really like having uh, my books in translation, in audio, in all the different formats. I've got them in hardback. They're available in other countries. And that is not something that was the case um, with traditional publishing. It just didn't, the books didn't work as hard for me now, uh, as they do now. Um, so that is, that's definitely a con to traditional publishing. They will tie up your rights. Um, and that's just what they do. I mean, that's not them just trying to be mean or something, but they're going to try to get your audio rights and every other type of right. And then they don't exploit them. Um, so they've got the rights, but they don't use them. Um, and I think with audio, they're trying to do better with that now, but it's still, it's still a problem. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed in groups like the Alliance of Independent Authors and a few other self-publishing groups is people who've been traditionally published and lost the rights of their characters. Oh, and that's gosh. one of the big pitfalls that people seem to fall into. And uh, from what I can gather, the general consensus is don't give up the rights to your characters. Yeah. Because that will be so hard to get it. back. Yes, um, if you can avoid it. Uh, if you, um, and I think probably we'll bring this up a little later with one of my series, but... Um, one of the series, I wasn't able to get my character rights back. And so the series is just unfortunately dead in the water after five books. And um, I, I really hate that. I have readers all the time asking me, you know, how about, you know, the Memphis Barbecue series? Can, can you do any more books than that? I'm like, I can't. You know, I've, I've asked them a few times. Um, but everything else I've been able to, to get back. So that has been very helpful. But yeah, that is um, character rights. Just having those, those creative rights, that is very important. Definitely. Yeah, because you put all the work into creating it and then, I don't know, giving it away is almost like giving away one of your children, isn't it? <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. And and then, you know, it's, you, again, you don't have the control about what happens to the product that you have created, <laughs> yeah. which it makes it hard. It really does. Yeah. So obviously you've been writing for a really long time. Yes. Um, how have you found that your writing has changed over the years? Have you found that certain life events have affected either what happens in your books or how productive you are? 
Oh, definitely. Um, I would say in terms of my writing itself, uh, I try not to read my old books. I don't know if you're that way too, but it's like, I am just horrified. I mean, it's not that the stories are bad. It's just, if I need just to know what happens, weird. I ask one of my beta readers because I know they have probably reread the previous one recently to remind themselves ready for reading the next one because they can tolerate it more than I can. <laughs> exactly. I can't do it. Exactly. I can't do it. Yeah, it's not that it, that they're bad books. It's just that it's so different from the way that I write now. It's like looking back on a 90s photo of yourself with like <sighs> the crimped hair and the big glasses and the tracksuit and being like, what was I thinking? Yes. And just needing to immediately close the photo album. You just <laughs> don't understand your fashion choices. That is a very good um, way of comparing it. I, I would definitely say I would feel that way. It's just like a terrible picture of yourself from, you yeah. know, when you're a kid. Awful, awful. It just makes me cringe. But and so I'm like, okay, it's not that it was bad, but what is it? It's just, it's like me, but it's not like me. Yeah. Um, so your, your style just evolves through the years. And then obviously the more you write, the better and quicker you get at it, especially if you're writing in series where the, the characters just kind of speak to each other, the dialogue, you're just going as fast as you can to keep up with it and that sort of thing. Um, it definitely changes and you just get better as you go on. Um, I would say life in terms of, um, you know, life changes and things like that definitely can be reflected in the writing. Um, anytime that I've had uh, sort of stressful periods of time, writing has really helped me actually. Um, but it's, it's tough too. Um, like last year, my dad died. And obviously 2020 was just a bad year for everybody. And I stopped writing for two weeks to go help my mom out and kind of sort through some stuff. And I was just like, so at odds. And it was mostly that I wasn't doing any writing because I, I do write every day. Uh, and I was just like, I have not, not written for two weeks, you know, in, I don't even know, decades or something. It was just such a strange, I felt so disconnected. And so I, I got back into it and it took me a long time to write that book. I had outlined a book during that time. And I went back later and I was like, oh my gosh, where was my brain <laughs> during this? So I, I mean, I was glad that I had picked it back up again, but I had to go back through and just correct the outline and, and make a lot of changes. Um, but it, it can be just really helpful in dealing with stress. Um, and then sometimes just be aware and be kind to yourself and realize, okay, I might have screwed some things up when my head wasn't totally into it. I wasn't really focused. And then things can be changed. It's okay before it comes out. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you can see behind me, I've got a picture of a Jodie Pico quote, which says, you can always edit a bad page, you can't edit a blank one. And I Excellent. always say that to my friends, and that is my mantra, like, okay, the first draft of what I'm writing might be terrible, but I'm getting the idea out of my head. And that is the hardest part, I think, because it's just all like a jumble, almost like one of those rubber band balls just in your head, and you've got to unravel it to get to the end. And I don't write in chronological order either which probably doesn't help sometimes but also keeps me writing rather than going oh I don't want to write this scene or I don't know what to do with this scene I'm still maintaining that momentum and that word count I've done that before too yes yeah. and that that can be really helpful um I just have to go back and fix the transitions later because the transitions yeah. will be a mess <laughs> yeah that's exactly what happens to me and I always say I write quickly but I edit slowly and that's because I want to make sure I pick up on as much as possible and make the book, you know, as great as it possibly can be. But like we said a minute ago, I'll still pick up on things when I go back through it. And that's why I can't go back through my old stuff. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness, it's just painful. <laughs> yeah, I did have to go back through my first book, What Happens in New York, um, a few weeks ago when I was working on my next book because there's an overlap in the story. So some of the dialogue's going to be the same. And I was reading through these scenes like, not as bad as I thought it was, but I still couldn't go back and read the whole book. <laughs> no. <laughs> it would just be too much. Exactly. So, circling back to what you said about taking a break from your writing, was that a conscious choice or was it just you weren't in the right headspace and you can do it or you didn't have enough time? Or uh, I ordinarily write at like 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning because oh there is gosh. nothing going on. I know that sounds crazy when I say that, but it's like nobody needs me, right? Nobody's like trying to text me. Nobody's calling me. Um, there's no, Nobody needs to have their email responded to them because nobody is up. 
Um, but when I was with my mom, I was like, oh my goodness, she was up. She wasn't sleeping at all. And so I wasn't doing that particular time. And usually I try to be extremely flexible with my writing. Um, but I had really gotten into this uh, routine where I was writing at that time of the day. And when that time of the day disappeared, uh, it just, I wasn't making it work. And then I had too many things going on in my head, just like, oh, I've got to do probate. I've got to do blah, 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 all these kinds of things. And, but I was aware that it was slipping away from me and it just felt wrong. You know, I missed my characters. I missed the story world. I missed the escape. I was like, even if I had just done 15 minutes or just opened up the document and looked at it, I think I would have been better off than I ended up being. Um, so I won't do that again. I just, I mean, I'll figure out a way to work around that. Definitely. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I certainly create a lot of my characters almost in a lot of my world for a sense of comfort. So if I take too long of a break, then I kind of lose that. And yes. it's like a piece is missing or you haven't spoken to your best friend in ages. And it's like, I, I should probably do that. But because it's been a while, it feels really awkward and you're not quite sure how to get back into it. Yeah. Awkward is definitely the word I was going to use. It's, it's absolutely awkward. And it's much harder to go back and start in again than it would be if you just did the five minutes or the 10 minutes or the 15 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, it just was like a Herculean effort to go mm -hmm. back and figure out where I was, I was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it really, it was very difficult, but I'm, I'm glad at the same time that now I know, even if things are bad, it's just better if I, if I try to write, it's not that I have to do it, but it's much healthier for me to do it. Definitely. Yeah. So some of your series are quite long. You mentioned one is 18 books long. Is that your longest? I think so. I think the Myrtle is, is my longest series. Yeah. So what's it like writing a series that long? Do you ever find you need to take a break from that world to write something a little bit different? Or can you just like go and go and go? I do need a break. <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I feel like I, I just need to have some time to visit with some of my other series. So fortunately, I do have three active series. And my way of working on it is a little bit different, but it's what works with me. So let's say I, I start, I finish writing a book in series A, and then I write an outline immediately afterward for the next book in that series, because my head is still in that story world, and it's still very natural, and I still remember what just happened in that book. And that takes me about a week to 10 days. I do about a 35 page outline. And then I hop, I know that sounds insane, but I, I've discovered that works really well for but me. And it's, then I just it's really interesting. I was yeah. talking to one of my friends the other day. He's working on a second book and she's got an outline. It's not 35 pages long, but she's started to document exactly what happens in each chapter. I'm like, my plan's a bullet point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like if I didn't outline I think my brain would explode I just but everyone has to write in a different way and some people you know find the outlines really help them I find my bullet points really help them you know everyone's different I did a bullet point type of um, outline for a long time and I think that would still work for me um, definitely if I had to go back to it for any reason I was a panster when I started out with traditional publishing and that worked, worked fine for me too until I ran into a plot hole about two weeks before deadline and mm. then I was in a panic because I was already under I'd already been paid for the book and the book was going to be late and I could not figure out a way around the plot hole. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, and I, I was talking to different people and I finally got some feedback that was going to help me get out of the plot hole. Oh, but I was like, I'm never, never doing that again. So I went yeah. from not outlining at all to doing sort of a bullet point method. And now I've got a template that I came up with that I use. And with my type of mysteries, it's different. So I've got, you know, introduction of suspects and kind of what the characters look like. And then I've got the first murder and then I've got interviews with the suspects and I've got a second murder interviews with the suspects. I've got transition points in between there. And then I've got like a moment of danger for the sleuth. And then I've got the wrap up. And so I, after I fill all of that out and I've just gotten more verbose because I was like, okay, well, the more I can make this run, the quicker I can make this go. So I do a book in about, I'm going to say two and a half to three months now from beginning to end, just done, um, which is pretty speedy with this outline, but the outline itself does take a long time. So um, that's part of it. And then I, after I finish with the outline, that's, I'm done with that series until three months later. And then I start on um, a book from series B, and which I had outlined three to four months earlier than that. 
and that's been a good, and I, I get the, the freshness. Um, I get to be in a different story world, but it's not hard because it's already an established series. Uh, and then I've got another series that I write at the same time that I write both of the other series. So I know that sounds a little crazy, but um, it's written in first person instead of third. So it's easy enough for me not to get confused. Sounds yeah. a little crazy, but. <laughs> no, no, I think it's really good. Do you find like when you go back through your outline a few months later that you pick up on stuff that you could do differently or better or that doesn't make sense? Definitely. And I frequently will end up changing the um, the murderer um, at some <laughs> point. I'll be like, I think I like this person better. And it, it's pretty easy to do that because then it's just all the red herrings turn out to be clues and all the clues turn out to be red herrings. So if you've got everybody set up that they could have done it, then it's a pretty easy change to make. Yeah, I remember one mystery author, I can't remember who it was, but they said that they write the book and then decide on the murderer. And then when they go back and edit it, they change who the murderer is so that it's a massive red herring all the way through the book. And then they go back in and kind of sow the seeds throughout so they haven't completely blindsided the reader. And like, it's I don't a good way of do doing that. it. Yeah, really? definitely. I mean, you can't, it, it definitely makes a surprise because then the, the writer is surprised too. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what the writer had actually planned to do. Uh, so if the author can be surprised, then you know the reader's going to be surprised. Um, I've had readers go, I knew it was going to be that person. I'm like, well, that's amazing because I didn't know it was going to be that person yeah. <laughs> until the last page. <laughs> yeah, the first time I tried to write a mystery, I planned it out in bullet points. And this is a well-known story that I tell to readers of the Writer's Cookbook and podcast listeners. So some people might be aware of the Poppy Winslow saga. And I went to my post-it notes on the eve of NaNoWriMo and it said Poppy finds out who the murderer is. I hadn't written down who the murderer was. <laughs> I didn't know what their motives were. I didn't know anything. And so as I was writing it, I think the murderer changed about three times and it ended up being the main character as an unreliable narrator who'd killed this character in some versions out of self-defense and sometimes out of cold blood. And I was like, this is just such a mess. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so that story has been abandoned, completely abandoned, never to be seen I again. I can understand that. But now, I mean, you can go back in and say, okay, Poppy does know and it's going to be this person. And then you could, yeah, because it's easy enough. It's easy yeah. enough to do it. I think I would definitely write the entire thing from scratch again on the off chance I did write that book. But I'm kind of more taking the learnings that I've got and applying it now to my fantasy because there are elements of mystery to that. But I definitely think I have learned a lot from that mess of a book. <laughs> I think we always do. I mean, no matter, I spent the whole 90s writing things that were never going to see the light of day. And it just made me just learn and realize I needed to change genres. <laughs> you know, it's all a learning experience. But your book sounds like fun. I, I'd love to have read books that have little bits of mystery in them, you know, regardless of what genre it is. Yeah, I love it as well. Like for me, my influences come more from TV than for books, which some people find kind of weird. But I've been comparing my first fantasy book to things like Charmed and Lost Girl because oh, sure. it is that sense of, yes, it's a fantasy story, but first and foremost, it's about family and it's about being there for each other, which is exactly the same as my other two series are about. It's just that this time there are also ghosts involved. Makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got to play to your strengths, right? Definitely. That's the only way to go. Yeah. Speaking of pen names and new series, you've also got a pen name for some of your books. Why yes. have you published some under a pen name? That is an interesting story, um, and it kind of ties into the traditional publishing and um, cons of traditional publishing there. Uh, that was the Memphis Barbecue series, and there is something in the industry known as right to hire. And that means that they, they hire a writer after auditioning them, and they have an idea. Where they, um, in this case, the Food Network in the States has was been has been a really big deal, and it was especially at the time, which was around 2010, I guess, um, where there were different um, show hosts on the Food Network that were cooking and just having fun. And so they wanted something set in Memphis, and they wanted to have a particular cast of characters, and they hired me to write that series. Um, but because of Right to Hire, they want to own the name. And in that case, it, I mean, technically, if they hadn't been happy with the books, they could have fired me and hired another Wiley Adams um, to take the place. Sort of like the Nancy Drew books. There have been a lot of books um, like that where they just continue a series under a variety of different names. 
Um, so I did not own um, that name. I, I was able to choose it and they were happy with the Adams for bookstore placement, which at the time was, was very <laughs> important. And you know that um, yep. with your name. Yeah, I've heard that one as well. I, do you know, that's not even a reason I chose my surname, but a few people pointed it out to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I'm used to being at the bottom of the alphabet. So I'll take the top spot now. <laughs> Absolutely. Adams is fantastic for bookstore placement. So it puts you kind of at eye level up there in the um, in the mystery, so whatever section you're in. Um, so they were happy with that. Unfortunately, that's one of the ones where my editor did leave. And so the, the series was limited and I couldn't get my character rights back because I really hadn't been in the part of developing um, on that side of it, even though I took them and, and changed them and added extra characters and that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, definitely a little bit disappointing, but lesson learned there. Um, I do also have a sort of a pen name. I go under Liz Craig for this zombie book that just would not leave me alone. I'm going, <laughs> do I have to write a zombie book? I don't understand how this idea came up or why it plagued me and why it would not let me go. But finally, I realized I was going to have to write this book and sort of exercise myself from this <laughs> idea that I had I love had. That <laughs> But my, my target audience is not uh, zombie people. So um, I wrote it under a slightly different name. I put it out and I was like, hey, I have written this book to my newsletter. It may not appeal to most of you. <laughs> and that's why I was like, I don't want anybody to accidentally read this book and think it's going to be a cozy mystery because it's not. Um, so I think that is a reason to do that. Um, I don't often want to write a different genre. Usually I'm totally happy writing cozy mysteries except for this one-off thing. And now people are like, oh, you should write some more of the zombie books. And I'm like, I just don't know if I can do that. What made you decide to write a zombie book then? I don't know. It was the craziest thing. Like I said, it just wouldn't leave me alone. And um, I, I don't know what it was because I'm not a zombie person. I don't watch zombie films. I don't like gore or horror. So I wrote it sort of like a cozy zombie. So all of the disturbing stuff happens off stage. You know, it's really, I mean, it could be, it's kind of YA, I guess, in a way. Um, it's, it's very gentle for a zombie, but I just, I have no idea. It's one of those things that just wouldn't let me go until I wrote it. And so I wrote it. I'm like, okay, I'm done with that. Thank goodness. <laughs> I can that keep on going. Amazing. This that sounds amazing. sounds amazing. <laughs> That's exactly what happened with the ghost crawl as well, actually. it w I was working on the Hollywood Gossip series, and I know it sounds really lame, but I had this dream, and it was about the climax of the book and the main characters and what happens. And I woke up and I was like, so I've got a book idea. <laughs> and then I just couldn't <laughs> shake it. And like I had no interest in ghost stuff before this. And I'd never really read a book with ghosts. No, I'd read one series with ghosts in that I absolutely adore, which is, um, why is the name gone out of my head? The Gateway Trilogy by E.E. E. Holmes. And I loved that. But that was, you know, because of the characters rather than because it was a ghost story. But then I just could not get these characters and this story out of my head. And then by the, the end of last year, I'd got, I think about... I'd been trying to draft it on and off, but focusing on the Hollywood books. And then by the end of last year, I'd got two first drafts of um, book one and two and the plot for the first four books. And I'm like, I've never written in this genre in my life. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> but it felt it's right. Just, yeah, you get ambushed by it sometimes, yeah. don't you? I mean, it's like you don't want you don't want to write it. And then just suddenly it comes up and you have to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think sometimes those books can be a nice change of pace, but also really fun to write because there's less pressure when you're doing it under a pen name no one knows about that's true exactly it it was just something i had to do but i was like nobody else has to be part of this <laughs> but i was like well i don't even have time to do this project you know i was like i am doing all of these other series um but i was able to work it in so and you yeah. can always work it in yeah exactly i found no one knowing about it really took the pressure off because the first fantasy novel i was going to write I think I've done three first drafts of it now because I hate every draft. Not um, <laughs> because I'm being harsh on myself, just genuine, genuinely, structurally, they don't work. And I'd hyped this idea up and this premise up so many times, like talking to all my friends and they're like, oh my God, I need to read this book. And then I was like, oh my God, all the pressure. And I, I just couldn't handle the pressure and it made me feel worse. So doing a draft of this book, no one knew about and no one reading it until I'd edited it, I don't even know how many times really made it a lot easier for me to write because I suffered really badly with second book syndrome and I found it super hard to work on my second book I don't know if you found that like with your second book or any second book in the series 
Definitely. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's, it's really hard. You've got to develop it, the things that you've started. But I, I think in some ways it's harder than writing the first book. Yeah. I and mean, I think that's why planning helps as well, particularly if you plan book two at the same time as book one or not long after finishing it before anyone's really responded to it, because then you don't really have to think as hard. You can just be like, oh, yeah, I've already got all these great ideas and they fit in really nicely with what I've done. And then away you go. That's true. Exactly. And then book three, I mean, sometimes the, the I guess, criticism or adulation or whatever kind of feeds into that. I do read um, my reviews. I'm particularly interested in my negative reviews to see what direction I might want to consider taking for future books. Um, do you find and, that messes with your head or do you find it really helpful? Um, I find it helpful. I mean, I had another writer tell me I delivered good customer service, which <laughs> I don't think was intended as a compliment. <laughs> Um, but I mean, it is true in a way, but it's like, well, I'm doing it mostly for them. Um, so I, but sometimes it doesn't work out. I know I had a couple of readers after one book that were saying, oh, you know, we're, this particular character is kind of getting on our nerves. You know, he's such a busybody; He's getting in the way of the story. And I was like, okay, so I broke his leg and then <laughs> no, everybody missed him that next. I mean, it was just, you know, you can't win sometimes if you try to make everybody happy. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say just take it with a grain of salt and um, and see what you can do. But sometimes it doesn't work as well as uh, readers think that it might. I have mm -hmm. taken profanity out of my book. It was just because of the genre. And I was like, mm -hmm. fine. I was like, I don't really care one way or another. And they seem to care. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to remove it. But every once in a while, I'll do something like Myrtle Cursed. And I don't yeah. say it, but I'm like, that's just what she did. And they can fill in the blanks however they want yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so talking about writing then, you've got a really amazing blog for writers. What led you to create that blog? Uh, my traditional publishers did <laughs> uh, back in 2010. And they said, this is what you need to be doing. And I complied. Um, I wasn't ever you know, just comfortable doing the reader facing thing, the portion of it, as I mentioned before. So I did change it to make it to be something for writers because I've always felt very comfortable with that. And then I just tied it all together with my website and said, okay, this is good for SEO because I update the content and I enjoy it. I enjoy networking with writers. I enjoy hearing their ideas and kind of feeding off of what other writers are doing. I'm interested in, in adapting my process to see if things will work better for me. And sometimes I have to ditch that because it works better for someone else than it works for me. Uh, but I just enjoy all aspects of it. And it's worked out really well for me. For one thing, it, it does make my site um, more, it comes up in the search engines better, obviously. And it has uh, evergreen content and then it just is always being updated, like I said. And I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been something that I've taken a lot of pleasure in um, over the years. Um, so it started off as being something I kind of had to do or was told to do. And it ended up being something really good for me. Did your publishers give you any direction in terms of the blog's content or were they just like, you need to blog? Uh, not at all, I would say. <laughs> they were just like, you need to have more of an online presence. You need... Uh, more of a community and this is what you need to do and I didn't know at the time very much about it I actually took a class and um, that was very helpful I took a class on all aspects of social media and Twitter was just getting started up and that's really when I jumped into Twitter was during this class if I hadn't taken I'm sure there's plenty of classes out there on starting a blog and um, developing a social media presence and I would actually really encourage uh, people to do that uh, because it prevents you from making mistakes like not putting things under your own name or you know putting it under a book title instead of putting it under your own name things like that um, which i probably i would never have thought of if i hadn't taken a class on on how to do this but i'm very deliberate with doing things and i feel like i need some instruction especially if i have no idea what i'm doing um, yeah. so i put a good deal of time into that and that worked out really well yeah i totally agree i i have an ma in creative writing and not long after that, I decided to study copywriting. And someone actually said to me, why are you studying copywriting if you've got the MA? Because they're different, not something different. Right. Yeah, they're <laughs> completely, completely different. different. <laughs> like, yeah. I've been, for my MA, I focused on poetry and screenwriting. And then my dissertation was a novella about World War II. You can't right. get much more different to copywriting. Like, poetry is probably the closest out of the three exactly. to copywriting. So I wanted to learn all these things to help me and to help you know, the company I was working for at the time. And I couldn't do that unless I put the work in. 
it helps so much more. I mean, instead of just scrambling and especially when you're scrambling, people are seeing this. This is not just something that's private to you. I mean, this is your advertising copy or this is your back cover copy or whatever it is. And so it's it's being exposed to all of these these folks that, you know, you just don't want it to be so much of a novice um, and just make these mistakes in a public arena or try not to. It's, yeah. it's hard it's not what, to. It's a weird line because you've got to learn as you go and stuff you get, you do will be better the more you do it. But at the same time, you don't want to be such a beginner when you start out that it actually ends up damaging the stuff you do in the future and i think that's where a lot of youtubers for example unpublish some of their older videos not because like they're not helpful to their audience but because they don't fit in line with what they're doing anymore or maybe they're a bit less natural on camera or they they don't have a lot of energy when they're talking or it's not as in-depth as it could be you know just to make sure that it's more in line with their brand but you do have to do stuff more and more to get better at it Definitely. I mean, you definitely have to practice. You have to put the time in. And we all expect to make mistakes along the way, but it's so much better if you can eliminate some of that because it's so stressful when you yeah. when you do make a mistake. And I've certainly made mistakes and I've tried to have social media presences under different names or different books. And that just, oh my goodness, that was just such a mess. I mean, I've definitely made mistakes along the way. Oh yeah, we've all done it. We've all done it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. So one question we ask every interviewee we have on the show is what is one book that changed your life? I would say, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. Great book. And just fantastic book, really drew me into the mystery genre. Uh, it was a crossover. I had been reading children's mysteries until then. And I think my parents were like, okay, she's ready to move on. She's read all of the Nancy Drews <laughs> and Trixie Belden's with all the different series that are appropriate for children. Uh, she's ready to move into Agatha Christie. And I think I was just stunned by that book. And it's hard to be now because it's everybody knows everything about it. But I really didn't know anything about it. And I think I was like nine years old or something like that. And it just blew me away. And I think, and then I read, of course, her whole series after that, but definitely was the book that made me want to write mysteries. No question. Very nice. Yeah, I haven't read all of Agatha Christie's books, but And Then There Were None was one that my friend recommended to me to kind of get more into reading mysteries and Agatha's books. And I'm like, I really want to try and predict who this is. But I never did. <laughs> and <laughs> I feel like since, <laughs> yeah, I feel like since I read that, I've gotten better at predicting who it is. But I have a feeling she could probably still outsmart me. She she was an expert at doing that. She was. Definitely. I mean, this is the woman who disappeared for several days and no one could find her, and she was just <laughs> hanging out in a hotel up north somewhere, and no one knew it was her. Yes, she was a very mysterious lady in real life as well as in her fiction. But she was um, just fantastic stuff. Yeah, she was like, uh, just the story of Agatha Christie going missing just is amazing. <laughs> I, I love to, it. She was... <laughs> yeah, I'll link to a video about it um, in the show notes for anyone who is interested in it, because it's just the most weirdest story. It really is. Like her car left abandoned on the side of the road with all her stuff in, and then she somehow gets a train up to up north and they discover it's her while she's dancing in a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> Because she not? was trying to scare her husband, which I think was probably a good thing because he doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> no, he really, really didn't. Back on track slightly. <laughs> Where can listeners go to find out more about you? At my website, which is my full name, which is elizabethspancraig.com. And you can find out all about me, my books, and where I am online. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great. Thanks so much. I had a great time. I really did learn a lot from talking to Elizabeth and I think she definitely made the right choice for her in her writing career by going indie for however many years she's been doing it now, I can't remember. And that's the thing, isn't it? Like you don't have to self-publish, you don't have to traditionally publish, traditionally publish, I said that really strange. You've got to find the right balance for you and what works best for you because a lot of people see trad publishing through rose tinted glasses, I think, but... And it's great for some people, but certainly do your research. Do your research. Yeah, it, it like you say, it's those rose-tinted glasses and people thinking that because they publish traditionally, they don't have to do X, Y, and Z. And mm. it's like, okay, you don't need to do certain parts of the publishing process, which are tedious, like copy editing and proofreading and cover design, yep. but you've still got to do that marketing. Yeah. Like when Elizabeth told me that she had to pay for her own book tour, that blew my mind. 
I know. It's insane, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. But I did have an interesting conversation with my boyfriend about it. Because it's like, yes, this is a business. And for the publishers, they can't guarantee they're going to make money. And they don't necessarily have the money to invest in every author. So they might pay for the book tours for the bigger authors. But for the mid-list authors, it's too much of a risk for them from a business perspective. The yeah. author technically has more to lose than the publishing house does. Because yeah. traditionally published authors whose first books don't do very well are highly unlikely to not just get a second book from that publisher, but to potentially be blacklisted from other publishers as well. Yeah. And that's terrifying. Well, it's a minefield out there. It's a minefield. It is. But that's you why research. we're here. That's why we're to here. To navigate it. To help you navigate it, give you some unbiased advice where we can, help guide you if you want guidance, share dish the dirt about the real stuff that's going on <laughs> and provide accountability and provide accountability yes i'm going to go and start that little little thread in the group right now remind people of our facebook group page please it is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash writing ingredients because it's after the writer's cookbook or if you want the quick link writers cookbook.com forward slash facebook group nice i'd forgotten all of that so I, did you like how i subtly segued into you saying it <laughs> it's only because i created the links that i know what they are i now have all the link the urls for my facebook groups remember no i don't i've forgotten the url for my readers group anyway did you find this episode enlightening don't forget to hit that shiny shiny subscribe button so that you never miss an episode or if you're watching on youtube give us a subscribe and hit the like button it really helps other writers find our videos and lets us know what type of content you want more of and don't forget you can support the writer's mindset over on patreon for less than your favorite coffee a month join our growing gang of writers to get early access to episodes bonus content and writing workshops and if you are one of our patrons, regardless of which tier you're on, you get access to early episodes, particularly from interview season, like three to four weeks before they go live for everyone else. So you get all the extra goodies. And our next episode is an interview with Nicholas Eric, all about book marketing. And it is juicy. Oh, juicy, juicy book marketing. Yeah. If you'd like to find out more, you can visit patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. See you next time. Keep writing. Keep writing.